Good evening. evening. Welcome to worship at First Evan Lutheran Church in downtown Racine on this Maundy Thursday as we ask ourselves what our appetites are like. What are we hungry for? What do we need? We need forgiveness, don't we? And that's exactly what we receive and what Jesus instituted on this day in the Lord's Supper. We'll be following the order of service that has been passed out to you. And so following the ringing of the bell, let's open with hymn number 416, When You Woke That Thursday Morning. May the Lord bless our worship this evening.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have heard again how our Lord walked the path of suffering which led him to the cross for our salvation. We have also heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and one another. This is the struggle which we were committed at baptism, God's forgiveness and the power of his spirit to amend our lives continue with us because of his love for us in Jesus our Savior. Within the family of the church, God never wearies of giving peace and new life. In the absolution, we receive forgiveness as from God himself. We should not doubt this absolution, but firmly believe that our sins are thus forgiven before God in heaven, for it comes to us in the name and by the command of our Lord. We who receive God's love in Jesus Christ are called to love one another, to be servants to each other, as Jesus became our servant. In Holy Communion, first instituted on this night, the members of Christ's body participate most intimately in his love. Remembering our Lord's last supper with his disciples, we eat the bread and drink the cup of this meal. Together we receive the Lord's gift of his body and blood for forgiveness and participate in that new covenant that makes us one with him and one another. The Lord's Supper is the promise of the great banquet we will share with all the faithful when our Lord returns, the joyous culmination of our reconciliation with God and each other. As we begin the solemn celebration of our Lord's passion, let us confess our sins to him, receive his absolution, and be reconciled to God and each other in Christian love. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us, he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us, has reconciled us to God, and has promised us the power to forgive and love one another. Relying on his promise, therefore, be reconciled with one another. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, in our words, and in our actions. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in the sacrament of Holy Communion, you give us your true body and blood as a remembrance of your suffering and death on a cross. Grant us so firmly to believe your words and promise that we may always partake of this sacrament to our eternal good. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is found in Exodus chapter 12. 
Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take lambs for yourselves according to your family size and slaughter the Passover lamb. You shall take a bundle of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and paint the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you are to go out the, of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord passes through to strike Egypt and sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe these instructions as a perpetual regulation for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, just as he said he would, you shall observe this ceremony. So when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? You will say, it is the sacrifice of the Passover to the Lord who passes over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. When he struck the Egyptians, he spared our houses. The people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites went and did all this. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, even all the firstborn of the livestock. During the night, Pharaoh got up, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud outcry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not someone dead. The word of the Lord.
Second reading is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a communion of the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a communion of the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. The word of the Lord.
Gospel is found in Mark chapter 14. Please stand. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. His disciples left and went into the city and found things just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, Amen, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and said to him one by one, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread with me in the dish. Indeed, the Son of Man is going to go just as it has been written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. (coughs) While they were eating, Jesus took bread. When he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them. They all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Amen, I tell you, I will certainly not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew, in the kingdom of God. After they sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We sing, Let all mortal flesh keep silence. Please be seated.
grace, mercy, and peace, these are yours in abundance. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text we'll be considering this evening is the second lesson you heard from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. Having just heard it, let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, open now our hearts and our minds, that we may better come to know and to understand your word. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. My dear fellow recipients of the very body and blood of our Savior Jesus, cravings are a universal human experience. Everyone in this room has, at some point in their life, experienced an odd craving, when you least expect it oftentimes too, isn't it? Any of the ladies in here who have gone through pregnancy know that cravings is part of the game. You're going to have strange cravings for foods you never would have thought you would have wanted when you're pregnant. Weird combinations of foods and stuff that you not already enjoy, but you want them at the strangest times. One of my favorite craving stories is my own mother, when she was pregnant with me, she has always hated the smell and taste of beer. Never wanted one, a sip once in her whole life, except for a hot August day when she was nine months in, pregnant with a very large baby in a very hot summer. She had one sip and enjoyed it. And that's how my parents knew they were going to have a boy. Because <laughs> day boys love their beer. But cravings can be fun, and it's not just a pregnant women thing, too. No, I mean, we Midwesterners know that after a long winter, every one of us will have healthy cravings of getting fresh air, like we had today, right? It was a gorgeous sunny day, it wasn't cold, it wasn't hot, it was a good day to be out and about, enjoying the spring weather. We all know the feeling of a well-deserved craving, right? Putting your feet up after a long day, enjoying a nice cold drink after a long hot day. These are all good and natural cravings. But like every part of the human existence, there are bad parts to these cravings as well. These cravings aren't always benevolent or even benign. No, unfortunately, everyone in this room has also, just as they have had a good craving, has had a bad one as well. A craving to do something you shouldn't, say something you shouldn't, go somewhere you shouldn't, let your mind wander into places it should not go. The temptation of the forbidden, the desires of the flesh, the desire to self-indulge, to elevate yourself, to give in to something that you don't need. My friends, my question for us this evening is, what if we had a craving for the body and blood of our Lord, for the body of our Savior, just like we crave those things in our lives? What would our lives look like if we crave the body like we do other things? That will be what we discuss this night as we learn to crave the body of Christ. Now, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is an instrumental letter when it comes to the teachings and doctrines of Holy Communion. In the, the text we're considering this evening, we have one of the main passages we consider when we're discussing communion. And then in chapter 11, verses 17 through 34, is Paul's discourse on communion. So the, yeah, the, this book is foundational for us to look at. And so what better thing to look at on the night our Savior instituted Holy Communion to consider the words of Paul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is addressing the struggle of idolatry in the Corinthian church. There, was, there were a couple of ways this was manifesting. Initially, the people were burdening the consciences of their brothers and sisters. They, there was a practice in pagan cities where there were pagan gods that sacrifices would be made to these pagan gods and then the meat from those sacrifices would be sold at the city market. As you can understand, some Christians did not feel comfortable eating an idol that had been sacrificed to Zeus or to Ares. But some Corinthians, they were very confident in this and they were burdening the consciences of other Corinthians. Added to this that there were some Corinthians who were so bold in their 
acceptance of idolatry that they would even still worship other idols, claiming that because they had the gifts of baptism and the Lord's Supper, they could indulge in their sinful ways because they were forgiven anyway, right? Paul tells them that this is not the practice of a Christian. Far from it. Instead, he tells them this. This cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a communion of the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a communion of the body of Christ? We'll pause there and consider that word, communion. It is a very broad word in the original language. It can mean many things, the translation that it has here, communion, a joining of things, right? It can mean an association, a fellowship, a close relationship, a sharing, a participation, or even a joint participation. And there is a lot packed in that one little word, isn't there, too? And so this is where we get the term communion, what we do here at the altar when bread and wine are served with the words of institution. That is where this word comes from. This joint celebration, this coming together, This word is so vast and so deep, there are three different words, different meanings we can draw out of this one single word. There are three different communions that take place any time God's people faithfully come to this altar. There is first and foremost the communion of those who are standing at the rail together. Those who are together holding out their hands and taking into those hands bread and wine, body and blood. It is a powerful communion, a powerful joining that we will address later in the sermon. Next, there is the communion that we have with our Lord. We have, of course, that horizontal communion we have, but then there's also the vertical, right? The communion of God coming to us, giving us forgiveness, giving us the complete and full assurance that Jesus came. Jesus lived, Jesus died, and he gave that body freely so that you might also live. Finally, then, there is the communion of the bread and wine miraculously bound together with our Lord's body and blood. There have been many false teachings that try to discredit this. There are people who claim that that bread and wine only represent our Lord's body and blood, that they aren't actually there. There are those that claim that it is only there in a miraculous or spiritual way, that the bread and wine aren't actually there present in, with, and under the bread and wine, as Luther so well defined it, but no, they're only there miraculously through the power of the Spirit. And then, of course, there is the Roman Catholic teaching of transubstantiation, that the essence of the bread and the wine is transformed into the very body and blood of our Savior. All of these things are unhelpful confusions of a simple truth. This is your Savior. This is his body and blood. He gives it for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Of those three communions, we'll begin our discussion this night by first looking at that third one, the communion of bread and wine, body and blood in the sacrament. Think about the reasoning behind the gift of Christ's physical body and blood for us to eat and drink. It's a strange thing for our Savior to want to give us, right? Why, out of all the things he could give and all the ways he could give it, he said, this is my body, this is my blood, take it, eat it, take it, and drink it. Just this past Tuesday, I had the awesome privilege of working with our 8th graders here at Wisconsin Lutheran School discussing this very text. Not this text, but the, the institution of the Lord's Supper. And one of the 8th grade boys had a very insightful question. I was ecstatic that he asked it because it led to some great discussion in class. He asked, why do we receive forgiveness in the Lord's Supper if we're already forgiven? It's a fair question, isn't it? We have the full assurance of our forgiveness already in God's Word, where he clearly explains to us that anyone who believes and hears these words of mine, they shall have eternal life. What an amazing blessing from God that he so clearly gives us what we need, the forgiveness of sins, in such a simple and easy way. Additional to that, we have the blessing of our baptisms, 
which assures us that at that font, our sinful nature was drowned, destroyed, and those who are baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may lead a new life. Given for all people, all nations, anyone can be baptized. Anyone can receive that full and free forgiveness. So why the body and blood? Why the communion of our Lord? Why the physical touching, chewing, and swallowing that our Savior provides? Out of all the senses, the senses of touch and taste are the most grounded, aren't they? Think about it for a moment. The eyes can grow dim, can be deceived by tricks of the light. There's much that can confuse them. Same goes for our sense of hearing. We can hear many things. We can have the assurance through what we hear, but our hearing can fade. Words can be misunderstood, twisted to form agendas. The sense of smell can easily be befuddled, especially in the springtime in Wisconsin when allergies plague the populace. Taste and touch, though, are much harder to confuse. When you want to know something is sure, you reach out and touch it, right? What's one of the main ways we tell people to make sure they aren't doubting anything? Pinch yourself, right? Feel something on your skin. This is a physical, solid, concrete way to remind us that we really are forgiven. You can feel the wafer in your hand. You can feel the cool, liquid wine in your mouth. You can feel the sensation of the wafer and the wine as you chew and swallow. You can taste the flour and the salt and the oil when you have that wafer. You can taste the grapes and the alcohol when you taste the wine. Physically grounding. Complete and full assurance that we can feel, taste, touch, chew, swallow that we are forgiven. If you doubt this, know that those senses are not fooling you. You really are holding and tasting your forgiveness. With such real and tangible forgiveness readily available, we should be tripping over ourselves to come and receive this gift. Our Savior offers it freely every first and third Sunday of the month. It's here. All services that we hold at our church, it's ready to come and be served. Pastor Eckley and I will always remind you, come for all things are now ready. We welcome you to receive it. Yet how does our sinful nature treat it instead? We want to satisfy our own desires. We want to fill the cravings of the sinful flesh. And so do we always crave this supper? No. No, we do not. There are days we treat it so shamefully that we think that we can skip church and skip receiving our Lord's body and blood because we don't need it this week. I don't feel like I need to be forgiven. We let arrogance and hateful speech distract us, thinking that we don't need to be coming to church and hearing these words so clearly spoken. We let sinful minds wander and take us to places in the web or in a book or in our own minds that they would never dare go. We let greed blind us to what we want in this world rather than what our Lord gives. Our sinful nature shuts down the part of us that desires our Lord and his forgiveness and pacifies us into thinking that we don't need communion. We boldly, like the lamb wandering in the lion's den, think that we can survive in this world and its temptations, not needing our Savior's counsel and aid, that he freely provides. How arrogant we are, my friends. How greatly we have despised our Lord's very body and blood given for you for the forgiveness of sins. At this point, I would ask you to please grab the hymnal in your pews and open to page 296. Just like in the Christian Worship 93, one of the resources this hymnal provides is, an op is a place where Christians can question themselves in preparation of our Lord's Supper. 
If you turn to page 296 and look at question number 20, you will see a fantastic three-part question from Luther in which he challenges us to consider if we think we really need the Lord's Supper. Note the first one. If you think that you don't need communion, place a hand on your breast. See if you have a heartbeat. If that heart beats, you need communion. Look also at the assurance that, that he gives that we are beset, my friends, by a devil who hates us. We have been marked as his enemy from the very moment that water touched us in our baptisms. He has said that I will try and destroy you and your relationship with your Savior. My friends, we need communion. We have arrogantly abused it. And this is why we must confess and repent of our sins. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, you are what you eat, right? This is true for what we indulge in in this world as well. We live in a world that is feeding us constantly the lies that we don't need communion. We don't need God. We don't need what he has to offer. Why wait? Why pass up on this forgiveness? Instead, come and receive it regularly. Receive the body and blood of your Savior. Receive the assurance he gives that you are indeed forgiven. Crave the body of Christ. This craving doesn't just apply to the body and blood our Savior provides in this supper. No, it applies to the body of Christ as well. Remember how earlier I said there are multiple communions that happen in communion? What an amazing gift we have. That we have the assurance that there is a communion, a joining of God's people when they come to this altar. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Take a moment and think about that. Think about how amazing it is that we have other Christians that we can come and celebrate this sacrament with. It is so terribly easy for our minds to delude themselves, for us to get lost in our own sinful thinking. In response, God gives us the assurance that there are other Christians, other reliable witnesses to the truth who can not only hold us accountable for the times when we fail, but can lift us up in encouragement and remind us that we are forgiven. We have received the forgiveness and we continue to receive it each and every time we come to this altar. Think about how Interesting that is, too, when you consider all the people sitting in this room. There are different ages, different genders, different socioeconomic circles, different skin colors, different accents. Yet we have all come here to this place tonight to do the one thing that God calls us to do, to hear his word and gladly obey it. Think of what an amazing blessing that is, that we can gather together as different and strange and sinful as we are and still be fed by the same Savior, still be joined in the same communion of the saints. Just like a drop in a pond will have an effect on every part of that pond, every Christian in this room has an effect on every other Christian in this room. Every Christian that, you, that speaks the, together the words of a confession or the words of a creed, they're reminding themselves and one another that we have failed, but thanks be to God, we're forgiven. And we believe that together. We stand together and confess together that we believe we are forgiven. Based on how we treat one another, sadly, none of us is worthy to come forward and receive this sacrament. There will be arguments among the people sitting in this room. Arguments about how we worship, the kinds of hymns we use, the way we sing the songs, the way our service is structured. There will be disagreements on how we spend our money. Maybe we should build here. Maybe we should expand there. There will be disagreements in households. There will be fights that happen in car rides on the way to church. We are broken people, undeserving of our Lord's forgiveness by how we treat one another. But then again, is that different from how any of the other people who have received the Lord's forgiveness act? 
Think of how the people would act in the months following our first lesson after the Exodus. Those people would be miles, not, not very far miles either, just a little bit outside of Egypt. And they would complain, have you brought us out of Egypt to die? Why, Lord? Already doubts form in the minds. They would go through the incident of the golden calf. They would have to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because they doubted. Because they treated one another shamefully. Think of how the disciples in the gospel lesson acted. Think of how they were acting at the supper just before Jesus instituted communion. They were bragging and boasting, debating among one another who of them was the greatest. Sitting at that Holy Communion on that first Maundy Thursday, there were men who would betray Jesus for a handful of gold, for silver. There were men who would deny they ever knew Jesus even though they had swore mere hours before that they would never forsake him. There was men in there who would abandon Jesus at the drop of a hat. Think of how we treat one another. After we leave church, how we treat the cashier at the gas station, the waitress at the restaurant, or the other drivers on the road. No, my friends, we have failed. But Jesus gives and institutes the Lord's Supper regardless. Jesus gives us the assurance that he provides forgiveness, that he will still provide it, no matter how shamefully we treat one another. Through this sacrament, we are forgiven and we are bound together with our brothers and sisters in the faith. We are reminded that this feast extends far beyond the people sitting at or kneeling at this altar here tonight. Notice how that altar is in the shape of a semicircle? That is very intentional, my friends. There is a reason behind that. Most Lutheran churches will do this. This is a way for us to physically see that this circle isn't complete. There are other Christians out there on the other side of that altar who are already seated at the wedding banquet in heaven with their Savior. There are other Christians out there who are miles away in other parts of Wisconsin or in America or in the world. And despite the time and the deaths that separate us, we still celebrate with them. When you kneel at this altar, you kneel there with your parents or your grandparents who have gone to glory. You kneel with a spouse who sits next to you. You kneel with children and grandchildren who are states away. You kneel with a Savior who gave his body and blood to feed you forgiveness. We are so undeserving aren't we? Yet we have received. God has given us a vertical relationship with him, a communion between a sinful people and a sinless God. He has given us a horizontal relationship with the people in this room and all Christians all over the world. So we can't help but say, how can I not help but crave the body of Christ? How can I not want to be among his people, be in his house, and proclaim his goodness to those who do not yet know? There is no doubt about it, we need the body of Christ. We need the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of faith that it provides. And we need to be fed with our Savior so that we can resist this sinful world and its temptations. And there's no doubt about it, we need the body of Christ. We need the brothers and sisters in this room and all over the world to hold us to our faith. To hold us up when we can't stand on our own. We need their unique gifts and abilities to complement and supplement ours when we fall short. My friends, we receive these things in our Lord's Holy Communion. Let us then pray for them using a prayer from Dr. Luther. Lord, even though it is true that I am not worthy, that you should come under my roof, Yet I need and desire your help and grace, that I too may become pious. So I come relying on nothing but the welcome words that I have just heard, with which you have invited me to your table, and promise that I, an unworthy sinner, shall enjoy the forgiveness of all sins 
through your body and blood when I eat and drink in this sacrament. Dear Lord, your word is true. I do not doubt this. And so I eat and drink with you. Be it unto me according to your word. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. For our confession of faith, we use two portions from Luther's small catechism, the blessings of the Lord's Supper and the power of the Lord's Supper. I will ask the question, the congregation is invited to speak the response. What blessing do we receive through this eating and drinking? That is shown us by these words, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Through these words we receive forgiveness of sins, life and salvation in this sacrament. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. How can eating and drinking do such great things? It is certainly not the eating and drinking that does these things, but the words given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. These words are the main thing in this sacrament, along with the eating and drinking. And whoever believes these words has what they plainly say, the forgiveness of sins. Please be seated for the prayer of the church. Dearest Jesus, you are the true Passover lamb who was slain for us. Your body was offered for us. Your blood spares us from death. We will lift up the cup of salvation. We will call on the name of the Lord. As Israel celebrated their freedom in the Passover, we celebrate our freedom in you. As we partake of your body and blood, draw us together as one body in faith. Lord Jesus, you displayed your love to your disciples by giving them your body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. Let this Holy Supper bring your healing and rest to those who are weary and burdened by sin, guilt, and troubles of this world. Cheer us with your real presence. Pardon us with your declaration of forgiveness. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise and thank you for your grace that you established this supper in which we eat your body and drink your blood. By your Holy Spirit, help us to use this gift worthily to confess and forsake our sins, to confidently believe that we are forgiven in you and to grow in faith and love day by day until we come at last to the joy of eternal salvation. You live and reign now and forever. Amen. Amen. We'll receive the offering.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil, who overcame us by a tree, would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Come, for all things are now ready.
which was given to death for you, the forgiveness of all your sins. Take the assistance of the body of our Lord and save us from Jesus Christ, which was given to death for you, the forgiveness of all your sins.
night I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of trouble and my life draws near the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavenly upon me. You have overwhelmed me with all your ways. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with what wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? I call to you, O oh Lord, every day I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do those who are dead rise up and praise? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness, or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, O oh Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? From my youth I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me of me. The darkness is my closest friend. 